we can play it on my Nintendo Entertainment System. This is my DS. I spent a lot of time on this as a child, so much so that my original one broke. As a result, some of my favourite games and the ones I feel most nostalgic about are on this system. And when I wasn't playing quality games such as Happy Feet 2 or Combat of Giants Dinosaurs, I was playing actual good games like Pokemon Diamond, Mario Kart and Dragon Quest IX. Dragon Quest IX Sentinels of Starry Skies is a Japanese role-playing game in which you play as a celestial or angel and are tasked with retrieving figs from the mortal world so that you can enter the realm of the Almighty. I knew none of this back in about 2008 and just got the game because my best friend had it. This might explain why very little thought has been put into my main character. He's a minstrel class which we'll get into a bit later. He's got massive bright purple spiky hair and his name is Doogee. I came up with this incredible name by reversing my own name, realising Edudge sounded terrible. So I took the E to the end and then I got rid of it completely and replaced it with an I. And now it's potentially the best name for a character in the history of video games. So, to summarise the beginning, you save some people from a slime and a cucumber with a spear, you learn that you're actually an angel or celestian, and you gain a substance called benevolence by helping mortals. But you need to give the benevolence to the yug... 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 um... yugdrasil? A tree, so it can grow massive golden figs. This apparently means the celestians can then travel to the realm of the almighty. However, a mysterious force knocks all the figs off the tree and scatters them across the world. You also fall from the sky directly into a waterfall, and then awaken without any wings. You have to convince a very annoying fairy, who's comparable to the hey, listen. fairy from Legend of Zelda, that you're a Celestian, and then you agree to help her fix her magical flying train so that you can fly back to the Angel Realm. But before that, you need benevolence, which you obtain by helping people. You find out a person called Patty needs help, so you go to a place called the Hexagoon and find this horribly deformed cow, which is actually the first boss of the game. You save Patty by killing the cow, and then find out she's going to a town called Stornaway. So you venture out and fight a load of slimes and cucumbers with spears along the way. The fights in Dragon Quest are turn-based and you can level up different abilities depending on your class to learn new moves. Once you get to Stornaway, you find out Patty runs an inn, which includes all the crafting you'll ever do, recruitment of new characters to add to your team, and wonderful multiplayer access, which allows you to visit friends' worlds. This is where I assembled the rest of my team. My first recruitment was a warrior named Quantum. Whoa, what a cool name! I know, I thought of it myself. Warriors deal a lot of damage, however they're really slow and they always attack last. The second character was a martial artist called Karatan, which again, is a very edgy name. But this guy uses Wolverine claws and he's really quick so he always attacks first. My last character was a mage called Eric, who, as you'd imagine, uses spells. <sighs> I don't know why, but for some reason I hate Eric. I've always hated him, and honestly I have no idea why, but look at him. Uh, so eventually he got replaced by a gladiator called Boz, who only uses his fist and just runs up and punches everything. But this wasn't for a while, so Eric travelled with us and I just abused him the whole time. Following on with the story, after getting to Stornway, you defeat a mini-boss called the White Knight, who of course is black. You then travel to the small town of Zir to sing a nursery rhyme with a granny, which lets you know that you should be heading north. This takes you to an area known as Brigadoon, which contains another boss called Morag, who turns out to be a mixture between Medusa and Batman. After defeating her, you can return to Stornaway, talk to the king, and unlock something called the Crackpot, which is Dragon Quest's answer to the crafting table. Only it's 1000 times more complicated! The alchemy in this game is ridiculous. You can make some very good weapons such as the Inferno Blade with relative ease by just collecting items from around the world. However, to make any of the god tier equipment requires hours of searching dungeons, hoping for rare drops of particular items, and that only creates the first components, and they have to be combined with other rare loot to make a weapon that has to be combined with more rare loot. So my tactic was just to forge the best equipment I could using the wiki before I lost track of what I needed and just gave up. Unfortunately, at this point, you still don't have enough benevolence to fix the magical flying train. So you travel to Coffinwell. Sadly though, everyone who lives there has the plague. In an attempt to find out what's causing the bubonic plague, you speak to the town's resident medic, 
Dr. Flegming, who says the curse is emanating from a dungeon outside town called the Quarantomb. After battling through mushrooms and slugs, you'll reach the fourth boss of the game, Raging Contagion, who looks like Mike Mazowski on acid. This guy is so annoying to kill because he just constantly spams a move which puts your whole party to sleep. When you finally defeat him, the curse is lifted and you can now fix the magical flying train and fly back up to the Celestial Observatory only to discover the massive golden figs have gone. Your main character then starts praying to the Yggdrasil tree, but he prays so hard that he falls asleep and has a fever dream about a guy who wants to destroy the world or something. It's probably fine. You then set out to find the massive golden figs and discover that, like Will Smith's genie, they can grant wishes. However, the wishes don't always come true, and sometimes they completely disfigure the person who tries to use them. You also learn Zoom at this point, which is a spell that allows you to fast travel, and is very useful considering the size of the map. The annoying fairy then takes you back to the real world, this time to Waltrade's Abbey, where you can change your class or vocation to learn new abilities that wouldn't be unlockable otherwise. There are six basic classes in Dragon Quest IX. Warrior, Quantum, Priest, which is a healer, Mage, which is Eric, Martial Artist, which is like Jackie Chan, Thief, which is really good for alchemy because you can learn a move that steals items from enemies. Minstrel, which in reality would be someone who plays a flute and dances around, but in this game it's a pretty OP class. And there's also some classes that are unlockable by doing specific quests later in the game. This includes Gladiator, Sage, Paladins, which are very good, Ranger, Armamentalist, which I didn't even realise existed, and Luminary. However, when you reach Ultra's Abbey for the first time, you realise that the guy who allows you to change vocations, Abbot Jack, also known as Jack of All Trades, isn't there. You also hear that someone gave him a shiny fruit and he's been missing since, so you can see where this is going. You then go to the Tower of Trades and climb up each level, fighting monsters along the way, until at the top, you find that Jack of All Trades has in fact turned into Master of Nun. After fighting him, he comes to his senses and explains that eating the massive golden fig made him evil. Anyway, continuing down south, we find Port Laffin. Port Laffin is a fishing village that's fallen on hard times. You meet Jonah, a girl whose father was lost at sea after a recent earthquake. Ever since, she is somehow able to summon Leviathan, a giant whale, to bring fish to the shore. When you return to Port Laffin at night, you can speak to a ghost down by the water who says, Oh, Jonah's actually possessed by a demon spirit or something and she doesn't actually just have telepathic connection with a giant whale. Then you realise Jonah is missing, so you set out in search of her, and after battling millions of crabs, you find the mayor of the town trying to use Jonah to control Leviathan. Leviathan. This doesn't seem to be working very well. Oh. You have to defeat Leviathan in a boss battle, and afterwards, it turns out that Leviathan is actually being possessed by Jonah's dad, and that he found a massive golden fig out in the ocean, and then accidentally merged himself with the god of the sea. Anyway, you wake up the next morning in the mayor's house and decide to set sail on a boat, eventually landing at Slurry Key, a small village with absolutely nothing to do in it. Heading almost to Doorbridge, you discover that a trader passing through the town gave a fig away in return for a pair of Nike Vapor Max to a man who lives in Zeer Rocks. Zeer Rocks is completely identical to Zeer, but it's made from rocks. You meet a talking sign that tells you the man who has the fig carved the entire town out of stone. Uh-oh, an earthquake. Oh no, Garth Goyle is in town and he's incredibly easy to kill. After Garth Goyle is dead, you head back inside and find that the guy with the fig has passed away. And while on his deathbed, he wished for a guardian to protect the town he spent a lifetime carving. Unfortunately, this guardian was Garth Goyle, uh, the guy that you just killed. The conversation becomes awkward. Everyone goes silent, but the slime thanks you anyway and gives you the fig. Continuing on to Bloomingdale, you've heard rumours of a rich, kind and popular lady called Marion who used a large glowing fruit to cure herself of a life-threatening illness. Upon speaking to her, she seems incredibly rude and the guards inform you that recently she's gone a bit weird in the head. The next day, news spreads that she's been kidnapped and taken to a cave that's very creatively named Bad Cave. Upon further inspection of the castle graveyard, you find a ghost next to one of the graves and it turns out the real Marion is dead, and the Marion everyone knows today is a doll that's gone mental on Fig, after being fed one by Marion's old servant. When searching for the Marion doll, you meet the kidnappers, but Marion has escaped from the cell where she was kept. After a long time spent running through random caves, you find her, but a massive spider jumps out and it's another boss battle. After defeating the spider, the doll gives you the Fig, and you're also rewarded with your very own boat. This means you can pretty much go anywhere you want next in the game, but I think what most people did, and what I did, was head to Gleba.
The most useful thing about Gleaver is that if you go to a certain spot in the desert, you can find an enemy called a Golden Golem, which anyone who's played Dragon Quest before knows is basically just a gold farm. At this point you may have noticed a bit of a pattern with the stories from each town. Everywhere you go, someone or something seems to have gone mental on Fig. You have to defeat them to break the curse, and then you obtain the Fig. Gleaver's no different. The Queen of Gleaver is sad that her pet lizard has run away, so she sends you out to find it. On the way to finding the lizard, you'll also find a Fig, and when returning both Fig and Lizard to the Queen, you find out she plans to have a bath with the lizard. This would be weird to begin with, but she also plans to chop up the fig and float the pieces in the bath with her. So unsurprisingly what happens is that the lizard bites a piece of fig, goes mental on fig, and you have to fight it. Once you've beaten the lizard and it's returned to normal, you're rewarded with the fig and you can carry on your journey. The next area I went to is called Batsarig, which is a small hunting village and also the most confusing place in the game. If I get this part of the story wrong, I do apologise, and you're gonna have to bear with me because not only am I losing my voice, I also don't know how to pronounce any of this. But as far as I'm aware, this is what happens. After talking to the chief of Batsarig, Batkan, and his assistant, Sarantsatsral, a monster attacks the village. Sarantsatsral offers you help in finding the fig if you kill the beast, which turns out to just be a baboon. The baboon runs off, and you're asked to go with the chief of Batsarig's son, Batsarig, to hunt it down. However, Batsarig tells you he's actually friends with the baboon, and that Sarant Satsral is the real monster in disguise. You then go on an adventure to find grass, which will reveal the monster's true form. And when you return successfully with the grass, Sarant Satsral... Hang on. Sarant Satsral transforms into Lastastanaras which I've actually figured out just now is Sarant Satsural backwards. Anyway, you defeat her, you get the fig, and you can move on to the next place, which for me was Swine Dimples Academy, situated on the Snowberian coast. Upon arriving, you're assumed to be detectives and are told of several disappearances of students attending the school. Again, you can see where this is going. You meet Fred and his friends who say they've been seeing ghosts and know how to communicate with them. Whatever. Fred then becomes possessed by a ghost and jumps off a roof before scurrying away. You end up exploring an abandoned part of the school before finding Fred and his friends being taught by a ghost called Sir Stern of a Swine Dimple. He then rages at you and turns into the Dreadmaster. And as you'd expect, once you defeat him, you get a new fig. And there it is. That's all the figs collected. The only thing to do now is head back to the observatory and return them safely to the tree. Uh-oh, watch out! The Gittish Empire are here! A group of evil things made up of a huge owl and a dragon that were thought to have been wiped out years ago. They attack you and you fall from the sky again, this time waking up in a small town called Wormwood Creek. Upon speaking to the mayor of Wormwood Creek, you find out about a dragon called Greynarl, who is said to be able to defeat the evil dragon, Barbarous, that you just encountered. Greynarl lives in a place called the Upover, and the only way to get there is through the bow hole. A ghost called Serena opens up her bow hole. Sorry. <laughs> That's not right at all. <laughs> a ghost called Serena opens up the bow hole for you, and after travelling through the hole, you find a bow. You battle a boss called Gadrongo to obtain the bow, and when fired, a bridge of light appears which takes you to the upover. When you enter the upover, you're told that Greynar lives atop a volcano called the Magmaru, and when you find him at the top, he attacks you, suspecting you're part of the Gittish Empire. After defeating him, he refuses to help you, which is kind of fair enough because you just beat him up. But once you find out the town of Upover has been attacked by Gittish Empire, by a scout. He gives you some cool armor and lets you ride on his back for a bit. Barbarous rocks up and then the best cutscene in the entire game occurs. Barbarous is defeated by Greynarl, but then he isn't, and he charges up a massive ball which he aims at the upover. Greynarl lets you off his back and then acts as a meat shield for the upover, supposedly dying in the process. You wake up in prison but not just any prison, because this prison has a free healing station that anyone can use. And not only that, but it's very easy to escape. All you have to do is start a fight, shut off one of the generators, and you're out. To make it slightly harder, you then have to battle the Gorum Hog, one of the lieutenants of the Gittish Empire, and at this point, I should probably explain exactly what the Gittish Empire is. So 300 years prior to this story, a guy called King Godfrey and his army attempted to take over the world by allying with the evil dragon Barbarus, believing themselves superior to the rest of mankind. It's like if Hitler had a dragon. Greynarl, the good dragon, with the help of the rest of the world, eventually defeated them, which is why everyone's confused about how they've returned. The Gittish Empire is three lieutenants, a pig, who we just defeated, a cat, and an owl, but we'll get to those in a bit. It turns out the person who you escape prison with is actually the captain of the magical flying train, and he takes you to the observatory. 
you can now assemble all of the massive golden figs and make your way to the realm of the Almighty. Here you'll find out that a dark force has resurrected the Gittish Empire and seeks to destroy the world. Therefore, it falls to you to save it. But where could the Gittish Empire be hiding? Maybe in Port Laffin with the Big Whale, or maybe at All Trades Abbey, or maybe this massive evil castle. So you descend to Gittingham Palace, and it turns out your suspicions were right. At the entrance stands Hootingham Gore, and no joke, this guy is impossible to kill. I hate this owl. All he does is hide behind these knights, and then he just completely wrecks you when you can't hit him. And it's annoying, because when I looked him up, it describes him as not very difficult. So after decades of levelling up against red dragons outside the palace, battling over and over and over again, I gave up and got my friend who was level 99 to come over to my world and kill it. After the owl, you explore the grounds of the castle and eventually run into the second lieutenant, Gorsby Purvis. I found him pretty easy to be honest, especially compared to the owl, however his main strength is that he gets a lot of critical hits, whereas I had a shield that blocked almost all critical hits, so. Finally, you battle the leader of the Gittish Empire, King Godwin, who is also surprisingly not that much of a problem. But wait, he's transformed into the Basilisk of Harry Potter, and now he's almost impossible to beat. The main tactic I found was to use a move called Egg On, which ups your character's attack. If you use this over and over to the point where he does a ridiculous amount of damage, you can just rinse and repeat until he finally dies. Now the Gittish Empire is seemingly destroyed, it's time to find out what was behind their return. So you travel down to an area below Gittingham Palace called Oblieta. After finding your way through the dungeon, you discover a prison cell. A mysterious man is chained up in the middle, who you learn is called Corvus. You free him and he reveals that he was the one who revived King Godwin and the rest of the Gittish Empire. He also does this really creepy thing with his head and you're launched into a battle with him. However, it's impossible to attack him as he was once a high-ranking Celestian and the Law of Celestians means you can't attack those who are ranked above you. He then KOs you and flies away with your boy Barbarus before a ghost called Serena turns up and explains who Corvus actually is. She tells you how Corvus was injured 300 years ago in the war between the Gittish Empire and the Celestians. She took care of him in the town of Wormwood Creek, however, when the Gittish Empire soldiers came to hunt him down, he decided to go out and face them. Serena convinced him he was still too unwell, and that instead, he should hide in a nearby cave. But, when they reached the cave, Corvus explained he couldn't just sit there and watch the town get destroyed, so he asked Serena to stay in the cave while he went to protect the town. Serena finally allowed him to go, but not before eating a special healing medicine. The medicine actually puts him to sleep, and Serena explained she couldn't allow him to fight, fearing his own safety. Unfortunately though, Serena's father has traded the safety of the village for information on Corvus's location, and Gittish army troops find them. Therefore, Corvus thought Serena had betrayed him by sedating him. Corvus was then taken away to be locked underneath Gittingham Palace, while Serena and her father were executed. While locked away for hundreds of years, Corvus grew to hate all mortals because of what he thought they'd done to him, becoming more powerful in dark magic as each year passed, and eventually being able to resurrect King Godwin, tasking him with destroying the mortal world. The only person who can stop him now is you, and hearing he plans to turn the realm of the Almighty into his evil fortress, you go to the Yugdrassel Tree for help. The Yugdrassel Tree can now talk, and tells you that in order to be able to attack Corvus, you need to give up your immortality. And so in return, the Yugdrassel Tree draws benevolence from all over the world, and creates the ultimate massive golden fig. Once you eat the fig, you'll then become mortal, and can travel to the realm of the Almighty. When you get there though, it turns out Corvus has already converted it into his evil lair, and to get to him, you'll have to complete a whole series of boss fights. This part of the game is like the Elite Four in the Pokemon League. First, you must battle the Gorum Hog, Hootingham Gore, and Gorsby Purvis again, except this time, they're all mildly easier. Then it's on to Corvus, who is very surprised at the fact you can hit him, and so goes into a cocoon to hide. Then he realises that you could just attack the cocoon, so he calls Barbarus to his side as the fourth member of the Elite Four, but even though Barbarus may be able to destroy entire villages in one blast, he isn't that good in a turn-based role-playing game format, so you defeat him with relative ease. The one thing he does do though is give Corvus time to morph into a beautiful butterfly. Psych, he's actually the devil, but green and real. This is it, this is the final battle, what it all comes down to. Corvus will use his best attacks such as vaping, bitch slap, cold vaping, and Jackie Chan style flying kick, but eventually, after a long and battle, he'll be defeated.
Even though you defeated him, Corvus will still try and go Super Saiyan, and destroy the world, but just in time Serena turns up, explains what really happened when Corvus was captured, and gives him a glow stick that turns him back into a normal angel. They then shoot off into the stars together, and you're transported back to the observatory. It turns out that this whole time the Yggdrasil was actually a woman pretending to be a tree. She congratulates you on finishing the game, the angels fly up to the realm of the Almighty, you're given the keys to the magical flying train, and the game ends. So why do I love this game? As I said before, it does have a strong nostalgia factor, but much more than that I just love the style of it, because although the story follows quite a generic narrative of good versus evil, the unique characters, bosses and locations keep you invested in the game and immersed in the world. I also think the elements of customization in the game, such as being able to create each member of your party and kit them out with whatever outfit and equipment you want, from tryhard to completely stupid, helps you become attached to your characters so that each battle becomes tense because you really don't want to die. It's like naming your dog in Minecraft and then it falls in lava. Another great thing about the game is just how many abilities there are. Just my main character alone could eventually learn moves like Giga Gash with the sword, as well as moves with fans, whips, and also magic moves such as Kaswoosh. You can even unequip everything and level up your fists, which leads to my favourite move in the entire game, Claptrap. Last but not least, the music is amazing in this game. I've been throwing in some of the pieces in the background throughout the video, but if you want to encompass the mood of the entire game, all you have to do is listen to the main theme. I'm going to let it play out the video, but thanks for watching. This was quite different to anything I've done before, um, probably going to be much longer than anything I've made before. During recording these voice lines, I actually lost my voice. I had to take like a whole day's break and then come back. So if my voice sounds a bit strained at any point, uh, I can only apologise. Please subscribe or I'll send Eric round to kaswoosh your house. House. But yeah guys, I'm just gonna hit the zoom uh, and just teleport out of here. Thanks for watching. <laughs>